Price. That's the number one technical indicator. You do best by investing for the longer term. If you can't explain what the business is doing, then that is a huge red flag. Some technological change is going to put you out of business. It really is a genuinely extraordinary situation. Hello, everyone. I'm Ed Gotham, and welcome to Opto Sessions, where we interview the top traders and investors from around the world, uncovering their secrets to success. Today, I welcome Mark Yusko, the founder, CEO, and chief investment officer at Morgan Creek Capital Management and managing partner at Morgan Creek Digital Assets, which is crypto. He currently manages close to two billion in discretionary and non-discretionary assets at Morgan Creek. That's dollars. He's known for his alternative thinking about investments and interest in emerging asset types. It makes sense then that a cornerstone of Morgan Creek investment philosophy is to invest in innovation. In this interview, we touch on blockchain and digital currency as the greatest wealth creation opportunity of our lifetime, SPACs, Bitcoin, and how some of the best investment opportunities come from being an early investor in innovation. Thanks. Enjoy. Hi, Mark. Great to have you on the show. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me. No worries at all. It was actually uh, Jeff Ross who introduced me to you uh, whilst I was, um, well, not knowingly, <laughs> I see, did it, but he mentioned you whilst we, we, we were having a podcast two or three weeks ago that we, talking about Bitcoin and other cryptos and, and the trends at the moment. And he mentioned you, you were one of his sort of like mentors. So um, I quickly started obviously following you on Twitter and, and realized uh, you've got a load of amazing content and some great sort of advice. Uh, on, on what's happening uh, in the markets, um, and that's actually how, how it all came together. So, well, no, I appreciate I appreciate him making that that referral, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to to have a chat today. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, and actually, whilst I was doing that, I, I noticed um, on your Twitter your hashtag two point one quadrillion. Yes. Is it, is it possible? I couldn't find out what it was. And I don't know if you can go into... No, no, it's interesting. I, I, I've left it out there so, so people will kind of think about it. But basically, it's the number of Satoshis. Got you. So if you take the 21 million Bitcoin, you divide it out into eight decimal places, you get 2.1 quadrillion potential ownership units. You know, I think ultimately we need to move away from you know, Bitcoin as the unit of measure and uh, get down to the Satoshi level. But uh, that's what that is. So that's the lowest denomination someone can have. Yeah. And I mean, we could, we could change the, the code later if, if we really needed to. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the community could vote to change that. But I, I, don't, think, I don't think we need more than 2.1 quadrillion. That's a big number. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> um, that's really interesting. Yeah, I've, I've heard that being mentioned as Satoshis um, in, the, in like, the Twitter sphere. People are starting to talk about it, so that's that's, that's good that uh, I can finally put the put a name to it now. Um, also, I had another quick question about you. You um, recently spoke at Alts LA, yes, uh, and you, you mentioned something that was really interesting to me about um, blockchain and digital currency being the biggest wealth creation opportunity of our lifetime. Um, you mentioned art, real estate; every asset will be tokenized and traded yeah. globally. And I was just wondering if you could. Yeah, go into detail about its sort of vision and of the future and how it's going to impact wealth creation, et cetera. The short version, although I'll warn you, Ed, that I, you know, I don't do short well, <laughs> um, but I'll try. So the short version is, I, I do believe that we are transitioning from the analog age through the electronic age into the digital age. And, and what that means is in the old days, we had analog pieces of paper that we would exchange, pieces of money for stock certificates or bonds or whatever, uh, real estate titles. And eventually those things got put in electronic form. And now we trade QCIPs and the physical pieces of paper stored at DTCC in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And ultimately we're going to have digital ownership. And so every asset, every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every piece of real estate, every private business, every everything will be digitized or tokenized, and then we'll be able to own fractional ownership. It will trade 24 seven, no more of this markets being closed more hours than they're open, and it will be global, borderless. And, and that, that is a big, big, big deal. And, 
And so the, the best way I, I can think of to, to get people to visually see it is this concept of area under the curve, where the area under a curve kind of gives you a sense of, of value. And if you think about a parabolic curve, an exponential growth curve, it starts on the left-hand side of the upper northwest quadrant of a, of a graph, and it's, it basically runs parallel to the x-axis. Then it starts to bend upward as it approaches the y-axis. And, and then it goes basically parabolic or vertical against the y-axis. So it makes this you know, nice parabolic shape. If you think about the internet, so the, the web 1.0 is the area under the curve on the left-hand side. So basically where the, the parabolic curve is, is parallel to the x-axis. And if you looked at that area under that curve, you'd say, oh, it's not even that much. Well, that was Intel and Microsoft and Cisco and yeah, pretty decent amount of wealth. As you go towards the middle of that Northwest quadrant, you start to get to the bend of the curve and the area under the curve gets a little bit bigger. And that is web 2.0. So that's Amazon and Netflix and Alibaba and uh, you know first trillion dollar companies. And you know, we take trillion for granted, right? People <laughs> don't stop and Ooh. think what a trillion <laughs> actually means. A trillion, you, know, you and I would have to sit here and, and record this podcast for 31,710 years, which might be most unpleasant, right? I think so. And figure out a way to spend a dollar every second during those 31,710 years. That's a trillion. So a trillion is a really big number. And so the area under the curve of Web 2.0 was actually bigger uh, and the wealth creation was bigger. But Web 3.0, which is the blockchain era, is the area under the curve on the right-hand side of the Northwest Quadrant, which is where that that parabola starts going vertical against the y-axis. And, and that area is pretty darn big. In fact, you could argue that it's unlimited. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's going to be companies, you know, Coinbase just announced this morning that, <laughs> you know, they had 1.8 billion of revenue in Q1, more than all their revenue of last year, and that they are wildly profitable. And uh, when they start trading next week, it uh, is likely it's going to be a, a big deal. And What's amazing at the number that was thrown out yesterday for the valuation of Coinbase, which will now probably be higher, uh, it was equivalent to ICE, which is the New York Stock Exchange, plus LSE, <laughs> where you're sitting, London Stock Exchange, together. Wow. That's pretty amazing for a company that's not even 10 years old. So I think what people are, are missing when they you know, poo-poo this, or they, they, they just say, oh, I'm just not going to pay attention to it. What they're missing is this is an evolution of technology, the likes of which we've never seen. And, and I say that not to be hyperbolic, although I am prone to hyperbole. Um, but if you think about the way technology grows, it builds upon the previous technology. So, you know, back when we were going from you know, mainframes to microcomputers to personal computers, and then ultimately from personal computers to the internet, you know, we we're building the internet at the beginning on client server technology, which with the benefit of hindsight is just pretty crappy technology. And we were trying dial up modems. And so Netflix was a really crappy business in the early days because it took four days to download a feature length movie. That just is no one's going to wait four days. Um, you might wait 45 minutes for that song to download back then, uh, 20 years ago, but, but you weren't going to wait four days for a movie. So it wasn't until broadband really helped, you know, kind of build on the backs of, of that, that adoption of internet technology that, that we started to have real um, advances in tech. And then when the mobile net came along, we we're all you know, walking around with these personal handheld supercomputers, call them phones, but no one actually ever talks on them anymore. Uh, that the mobile net was was even bigger. But now we've got the trust net, which is the internet of value. And that's being built on top of the mobile net. And, and the exponential effect of that and how big blockchain technology 
and cryptocurrencies as a use case of blockchain technology are in terms of of just the the, the potential size and and importance uh, just really can't be understated. And and people yell at me when they when I talk like that, but it it's true. I mean, this is bigger and will be bigger than really any of us can imagine. And I think you know. Somebody said, I think it might have been uh, John Burbank. You know, the the key to success in investing is to imagine the impossible, and that's what you have to do. You have to imagine what what was previously unthinkable, and imagine that it's actually going to happen. And how do you get out in front of that and and profit from it? Yeah. And so when you when you say um, the biggest wealth creation opportunity, do you think that lies? Primarily in the companies that will, you know, be founded and exist like Coinbase and and leverage the opportunities here, or also in in investing in other companies or some of the coins, etc. Or are you talking about the combination? Well, the cool thing is for the first time, and that's that's the nature of, of innovation. You can actually invest in all of it, right? You can invest in the protocols themselves. Yep. Uh, you can invest in the companies that that provide the infrastructure to make the protocols work. You can invest in the application companies that will be built on top of the protocols, and then ultimately we'll be able to invest in the assets that get tokenized and utilize the protocols. So it's it's everything. I mean, the, that's why the wealth creation opportunity is so big. If you go back to the internet, right? There were eighty. Eight zero protocols that were competing to be the winner, and there was this one called TCP/IP, and Vint Cerf kind of invented it at DARPA, and then this guy Tim Berners Lee came along and and said, "Hey, I'm going to use that to to write a web page," and he created the first web page, and basically invented the internet, not not Al Gore, and you know the thing about it is Tim Berners Lee, not really a rich guy. I mean, he's doing fine. He's a professor, I think. It at uh, Harvard or MIT, I can't remember now. Um, he's doing fine. And I think he's got a new blockchain related company that might actually make him a really, really rich guy. Um, but he didn't get rich because he didn't own the yep. protocol. The guy who got rich or guys or gals or whoever, um, when I say guys, I mean everybody because uh, I grew up on the East Coast a little bit. And uh, long story is if if you think about um, back then, Zuck came along and created an application that sat on top of TCPIP. He gave it away for free, which now we know anything that's free is not free. You are the the uh, the asset or the product, and and he became a gazillionaire. And a lot of other people become gazillionaires by building things that run on top of this free protocol layer, TCP IP, and the other protocols that stack on top of it. So in the internet, you've got a, a stack of protocols, TCP IP, HTTP, SMTP, um, FTP, and www. And in the blockchain era, now we have the first protocol layer, the first layer one Bitcoin. And on top of that, it's likely we're going to have other protocols, you know, maybe it's Polkadot, maybe it's Cosmos. Um, I'll argue that Ethereum is like www. Dot. Um, maybe Filecoin is like FTP, file, file transfer protocol. And ultimately, I think we'll have this protocol stack that's similar to the internet stack, but it'll be for the, the blockchain era. And investing in those protocols is wildly profitable, mm. right? People who invest in Bitcoin early or Ethereum early have made lots of money. People who invest in these other protocols that, that become the dominant protocols. Now, the problem is we don't know a priori which protocols are going to win. So you do need to probably invest in, in more than a few of them yeah. uh, and press your winners. But on top of betting on the protocols, you can actually bet on the companies, right? We, we run a fund that invests in infrastructure with 80% of the capital. Uh, and then 20% of the capital goes in the protocols themselves. And those funds, touch wood, have done quite nicely. Um, we own you know, a little piece of Coinbase. We own a little piece of BlockFi. We own a little piece of, of eToro and, and other companies that are taking advantage of, of this migration uh, toward the blockchain, 
blockchain era and, and the Bitcoin standard. Um, but we also own the protocols themselves. And we've, we've done nicely in, in Bitcoin and, and other protocols like Ethereum and, and a few others. Amazing. It's almost a revolution in the way finance is considered uh, today. Well, no, Ed, you, you bring up a really important point that I didn't even talk about, right? Which is, is the real revolution is still coming, right? And that's DeFi. So decentralized finance. And look, blockchain technology is going to do to financial services the same thing that the internet did to media, communications, and commerce. And it basically upended the incumbents. It created a, a landslide of wealth into the, the upstarts and, and the innovators and the disruptors. Uh, I use the example of ABC, NBC, CBS, right? The old network television companies. You know, they used to own everything. They owned our eyeballs. They owned our time. You know, I used to run home so I could sit down <laughs> at my TV tray on, you know, eight o'clock on a Tuesday to watch Happy Days, right? It didn't play yeah. at six o'clock or seven o'clock or on Thursday. It played Tuesday at eight o'clock. So you had to be in your seat. And they owned us. And they had all the market cap. And now all their market cap is in a company called Netflix. Well, how did that happen? Well, they were too stodgy to you know, give up their ad-based revenue model to go to a subscription-based model, and they got disrupted. Uh, they got outcompeted. And the same thing is, is happening today in finance. So traditional finance, the banking industry, where look, the banking industry was created because dual entry accounting mandated that you needed a trusted third party to verify the ledgers, mm -hmm. right? In the old days, if I lent you money, we had a single entry ledger, I would write down you know, that I lent you $100 and you had to trust me that I wrote down 100 and not 200. Because what if I came back with my ledger and said, you owed me 200, how could you prove different? So the Medici's borrowed from this monk back in the 1200s, this idea of creating a dual entry ledger, green ledger pads. And they said, oh, and we need a bank, which will happen to own all of them, along with the Rothschilds. And the banks will sit in the middle of the, these transactions. So if I lend you money, um, or if I want to send you money, you have to have a bank account. I have to have a bank account. We both trust that the bank keeps track of our money correctly. And by the way, it's not our money anymore. If we put the money in the bank, it's the bank's money. And you and I get an IOU, which is a dirty little secret. And they can steal the money if they want. They can do a bail-in like we saw in Cyprus. Yeah. Um, so all of that comes down to this idea that with the invention of triple entry accounting and, and blockchain technology, now we don't need the banks. We don't need these trusted third parties. And if I want to send you a Bitcoin, I don't need a bank account. You don't need a bank account. I just have Bitcoin. The network nodes you know, validate that I have the Bitcoin. They validate that I sent it to you. They validate that you received it and they validate that you have it. And then it's gone, right? I can't send you a copy because that would get rejected. That's the beauty of Satoshi's invention that you, you know, can have digital scarcity, uh, which is an amazing, amazing invention and innovation and sets the stage for just, again, incredible wealth creation uh, across, you know, every asset on the planet that that wants to be unique or scarce can now be that. We're seeing it impact the art market. We're seeing it impact the collectibles market. We're going to see it impact things like real assets and real estate. We've already seen it with digital gold and how Bitcoin is, is essentially a better use case uh, for physical gold as a store of value. Not that gold's bad. It's just heavy and clunky and hard to divide and, and hard to transport and hard to, to safe keep uh, compared to a digital form uh, like Bitcoin. So that's a lot of stuff in that, in that answer, but it, it goes to this idea yeah, yeah. That, that technology is evolving, that this is big, like really, really big, and that it's going to impact everything. Oh, I forgot to finish my point, which is traditional finance is being disrupted to centralized finance, which is you know, BlockFi and uh, Coinbase and, and other centralized systems. And everybody says, oh, I don't want centralized. I want to own my, you know, not your keys, not your coins. Yeah, that's fine. But the average person doesn't keep their money in their house under their mattress, right? They put it in the bank because they don't want to deal with 
safekeeping. They don't want to deal with $5 wrench attacks or, or gun attacks. So they, they use a trusted third party. And I think a lot of people are going to use centralized services to take care of their digital assets the same way they do with their electronic assets. However, there will be some that want to control everything. And that's where we get into DeFi. And there will be people who, who unbank themselves and, and use Bitcoin as a core you know, store of value. But then on top of that, take advantage of smart contracts in the Ethereum world to basically do everything that we do in traditional finance from lending to saving to derivatives to structured products. I mean, why should a human ever be involved in structured products again in the future? Yeah. Makes no sense, right? Why should we ever have a bearings, you know, fat finger ever again? Why should we ever have a Nick lease and stealing money again? We shouldn't. Mm -hmm. We can get rid of all of that with smart contracts and DeFi. And it's interesting we're talking about this revolution. There's always the old guard, you know, uh, just getting away potentially or, or try and use scare tactics to hinder adoption, basically. And we've, we've seen even Dalio and CEO of Goldman, I think, yesterday or, or to even today, uh, trying to talk about, you know, regulation, more regulations coming and, you know, sort of implying that, that you know, regulation will limit the opportunity in, in some areas. What do you think about that? Look, incumbency is an amazing force, right? It leads to corruption, right? Lobbying, just a fancy word for corruption. Regulation from lobbying, fancy word for corruption. And incumbents like to stay in charge. And what do they do? They build moats around their castle. They try it through regulation. Uh, they try it through FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, sowing the seeds of, of uncertainty. And you know, look, it, it's been true since the beginning of time. Right. You, know, you go back to uh, I ask people all the time, you know, why are the stoops of homes in downtown New York nine feet above street level? And people are like, I, I have no idea. Well, it's because of horse poop. So in the days of the horseless carriage, the street sweepers would push the horse poop to the side and it would stack three, four feet high. And ladies didn't want their dresses to drag in the horse poop. So they literally built elevated sidewalks nine feet tall and built the stoops of the homes at the level of the elevated sidewalks. Now those elevated sidewalks were actually really dangerous, right? Get drunk at night, fall off into this you know, pile of horse poop, bad, bad outcome. But the bottom line was when the horse's carriage came along, the street sweepers passed out pamphlets saying, if you got in a horse's carriage, you would die, <laughs> right? Crazy. Well, why did they do that? Because they didn't want to lose their jobs because they didn't want the horse-drawn carriages to go away. Well, guess what? You don't die every time you get in a horse's carriage. Now you can, right? I mean, people do die in cars all the time. They died in horses' carriages. I mean, in, in uh, horse-drawn carriages too, uh, when the carriage would turn over. And and then when you know the airplane came out, the train companies passed out pamphlets saying, you know, your body would cave in on itself if you went too fast. Silly, but you know, at the time people were afraid of that. And I think the same thing's happening here is you, you have Jamie Dimon say it's a fraud and you got Warren Buffett say it's rat yeah. poison squared and you got Dalio saying it's not real. And, and all these people have a vested interest in their incumbency. They own financial services companies. They run financial services companies. They like things the way they are. They like being rent takers, uh, middlemen. And in a world of, of decentralization, middlemen are not as valued. And that is a big, scary thing. And yet it's coming, right? There's no way this genie is going back in the bottle. It is absolutely impossible at this point to stop this wave of technology. Yeah. You're not going to change it with regulation because, again, we're global, we're borderless, right? China tried mm -hmm. to ban exchanges. What happened? They just moved to South Korea and Japan. U.S. threatens yeah. more regulation. What are they going to do? They're just going to weaken their position relative to the rest of the world. People are going to show up in, in the U.K. or in Jersey or in the Isle of Man or in Malta. Yeah. It, it's insane to think that you should always protect incumbents. 
that has never been a good strategy in the history of mankind, right? We didn't want to stay in the Stone Age. We didn't want to stay in the Steel Age. We didn't want to stay in the age of, of locomotives. We don't want to stay in the electronic age. We want to move to the digital age. Life gets better every single time we embrace and adopt innovation. We hope you're enjoying the episode. For interviews like this every Thursday, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, make sure you give us a star rating and leave guest suggestions along with any other feedback in the review section. Now, back to the show. Is it possible to give us a quick background you know, on your history, your career, what your role is today? Because you know, it's really interesting. Yeah. And so the, the quickest version is, is I, I grew up all over. I actually grew up most of my, my childhood out on the left coast. Uh, in Seattle. Um, my parents picked me up in the middle of high school and moved me to the East Coast. Um, so I went from you know long hair and bell bottoms to you know corduroys and short hair. And then the middle of senior year, they moved me down to, to Houston, Texas, where I had to buy a cowboy hat and boots. So I pretty much hated my parents for that four-year cycle, but uh, I've forgiven them now. And, and what it did teach me how to do, which is interesting, it, it taught me to be flexible. It taught me how to meet people taught me how to fit in. And then I spent a lot of time in the Midwest, went to school at Notre Dame in in Chicago. You know, I thought I wanted to be an architect, didn't love that, tried engineering, didn't really like that. Uh, Finally found something I loved, which was science. So I finished up as a biology and chemistry major. And what I find is that science is actually the best training for investing. And that was just luck, right? I didn't plan to be an investor. I, my life has just been a series of happy accidents. But scientific method is what investing is all about, right? It's forming a hypothesis, testing the hypothesis, gathering the data, being objective, and understanding that what is truth today through experimentation and, and conjecture and, and hypothesis will be different in the future. And you know every custom begins with broken precedent, and ultimately, uh, since I'm a biology guy, I believe in two things: right, growth and death. Only two states of, of physical beings. I like I like the former, you know, don't like the latter. So I like to grow. So I think that's that's an important element of of you know everything we do in in business and in commerce and in, and in investing is is all about growth. And then on the on the chemistry side, it's it's about you know, rate limiting factors, right? Things can only happen uh, as quickly as as the presence of of that you know least present compound. So, like if you're making salt, if you don't have enough Na, it doesn't matter how much Cl you have, you can't make more salt. So, I think those central principles of of science and this idea of the scientific method really framed my view that that innovation is an asset class and that innovation is what creates all great wealth. It's why my pinned tweet is, you know, the greatest wealth is created by investing in something that you believe in or others even understand. And you'll be mocked and ridiculed, um, but it's worth it. And that's how my, my career has, has progressed. As I said, series of happy accidents. I worked for an insurance company and the guy was doing investments retired. So I got to do that. And then I went to an equity shop and and then I got the aha moment to go back to the alma mater and learn about endowment investing. And that's when I really had the epiphany that investing was not about stocks and bonds, right? Everyone thinks investing is about stocks and bonds. Investing is about innovation. It's about asset classes. It's about big picture. It's about macro. And really, it's about embracing venture capital, growth equity, buyouts, and, and private investments where you get paid this illiquidity premium above the traditional risk premiums for equity and debt. And that focus on innovation throughout the course of my career has just led me, I say, you know, I've had this funny thing where I I tend to hang out with the bad guys. And people say, what are you talking about? Like, well, technology is always adopted at the fringe, right? Who's the first person to have a beeper, drug dealer? Who's the first person to use the internet, porn? And it doesn't mean they're bad people per se, but they're perceived to be bad. And and therefore, it hurts wider adoption in the early days because people think, you know, like what to say about Bitcoin? Oh, it's for drug dealers and terrorists. Well, no, think about that for a second. If you're a drug dealer or terrorist, would you rather do your transaction with a sack full of money 
that can't be traced or put your fingers on a keyboard with the risk of being traced. I'm going to use the sack full of money. Now, I'm not a drug dealer or a terrorist. Um, so uh, I don't have any real knowledge there, but my guess is they're going to pick the sack of money. But ultimately, investing in innovation and and spending time thinking about innovation and researching innovation and hanging out with people who are innovators and entrepreneurs has really been the, the best part of my career. And, and I didn't plan it that way. And I am sad in some ways that I wish earlier in my life, someone would have said, you know what, you shouldn't minimize risk when you're young, you should maximize risk. You should be maximizing your exposure to things like venture capital. You should be maximizing mm -hmm. the number of jobs you have. You should be sampling things. You should be innovating. You should be taking risks, not managing risk. When you get older and you have more wealth, that's when you manage your risks. And you know, it's better late than never, but I, I, I now really think it's important, particularly for younger people, to really understand and embrace. You should spend so much of your time uh, on the fringe, out there with these bad guys and gals, or the perceived bad guys and gals that are breaking precedent, that are innovating on existing uh, thought patterns or notions of, of what's right, and pushing toward, toward new truth. And you know, it's my big thing about Twitter. I, I love Twitter, right? It, it encourages dialogue and debate. And yeah, you got the trolls and you got, you know, you got the, the echo chamber problem, but, but generally speaking, it's a beautiful self-regulating community that allows you to try out new things, to meet new people, to uh, learn about innovation, to, to see how the world reacts to things. And it's, it's really a, a powerful tool. But, but ultimately, what I have found is I've gone from spending most of my time and most of my career focused on, on securities to now most of my time and most of my career focused on uh, innovation and companies and people and entrepreneurs and ideas. You know, there's the great line, right? Uh, small minds talk about people, average minds talk about events, and, and big minds talk about ideas. So the more time you can spend on ideas, the better. And talking about ideas, one of your sort of innovations was starting Morgan Creek Digital Assets um, more than a couple of years ago now. It's now one of the largest digital asset managers, I believe. Uh, helping institutions get exposure to digital assets or cryptocurrencies. Um, what prompted you to, to start that fund? Yeah, it's, it's a great question and, and I appreciate it. And look, I said, life's a series of happy accidents. You know, I, I went to my alma mater at Notre Dame, was the number two guy at the endowment there. After five years, I had a chance to come down here to North Carolina and be the CIO for UNC. I did that for seven years and then, you know, 17 years ago for Morgan Creek. And, and Morgan Creek in the early days was pretty classic, boring, you know, advisory firm and, and product firm. And we did some fund of funds. We did some hedge funds. And, you know, I like to think that we were a little innovative in that, you know, our tagline was alternative thinking about investments. We did more than just alternative investments. We, we tried to think differently and to get people to embrace new ideas. And part of that was we were always early investors in uh, emerging talent. I uh, believe in two things in investing, follow the money, follow the talent. And so we would always back new talent, particularly talent that came out of Tiger. And, and we fortunately backed this guy, Dan Moorhead, when he formed his macro fund, Pantera Macro. Eight years ago, he calls me up and says, hey, come to San Francisco, we'll have dinner. And uh, like, great, known Dan 30 years, we're good buddies. And Long story short, he said, hey, I'm, I'm shutting down my fund. I'm going to spend the rest of my career um, focused on Bitcoin and, and blockchain. I'm like, <laughs> what? And I said, look, in, in 2013, I was not running drugs on Silk Road, and I was not a cryptography student, so I just didn't get Bitcoin, and I didn't spend the time. I wish I had, but I, but I didn't. Um, but as soon as he said picks and shovels and backing the infrastructure to help with this transformation... Uh, and transition, I got it. Now that first fund of his, you know, it's great. It's up like 11 or 12 times, um, but I should have put the money in the Bitcoin fund. That's up 574 times, but I didn't. And so then I started talking to, then I actually did some work and I, and I got people to start thinking about it. Although I, I wrote, <laughs> I tell the story, I, I wrote one paragraph in a 40 page letter 
to clients in 2014 saying, I thought that Bitcoin might be an interesting, you know, special situation mm-hmm. investment, put a little bit in, not a lot, just a little. It was at 500 bucks at the time and literally had hate mail. Like people would call and say, look, we'll fire you wow. if you don't stop talking about this stupid stuff. So that kind of set me back a year. And, and But by 2015, I really was starting to dig into it and spending time on it. And one of the things that I found that was really awesome was, and I've only seen this twice in my career. So in 1994, 95, 96, I saw this massive migration of talent, particularly young talent, people like Mark Andreessen and others who were just absolute geniuses migrating to this new thing called the internet. And we made a lot of money investing in things like Google and Yahoo and eBay. Remember my board at Notre Dame saying, you want to invest in a, in a um, you know, garage sale company online? How stupid. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it turned out okay. I think we made 96 times our money or something. So um, <laughs> the key is that uh, there was this youth movement. And the same thing was happening in 2015, 16, as I started meeting these just incredible young people. And you know, I, I, I'm lucky in the sense I have this unique family. I have an older two kids, 31 and 29, and then I have a little guy who's 10. And that keeps me young, right? I have to keep up with him because I'll walk in at night and he'll say, hey, dad, let's wrestle. Like, you mean on the floor, wrestle? <laughs> I mean, when I was 35, that was easy. At 55 and now almost 58, harder. But uh, so that keeps me a little bit young, but what really has just energized me, and, and I feel like it's the fountain of youth, is you know talking to people like yourself, young people who've come into the space, and and one of those guys was was Pomp, and everybody knows Pomp, and you know we had met briefly, not even related to to crypto, but you know we were both uh, investing in this company called Lyft. We were early investors in all the ride sharing companies. We did Uber, we did Lyft, we did Go, we did. You know, DD, which actually was Quadi at the time. We did Grab. So, you know, we had a lot of exposure and a lot of experience, but we met, you know, for 20 minutes or so uh, in, in kind of 2017. We, we did that investment. And then I heard him on a podcast, literally like this. I heard him talking to Patrick O'Shaughnessy, and I'm like, huh, interesting guy. And I said, oh, I should spend some time with him. So I called him, said, hey, let's get together for breakfast. And Breakfast turned into lunch, turned into dinner, turned into the next day. And after about three or four days, we're like, man, we got to work together. So, you know, we hammered out this vision for Morgan Creek Digital at the end of 2017. And the audacity of it was, you know, me being an old guy, I was just kind of, oh, let's do what we've always done. We'll do another fund of funds. We'll do a little bit with people like Dan and Pantera and Blockchain Capital and Andreessen and and then we'll co-invest alongside those. And Pomp's like, no, 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 let's invert it. Let's become one of the leaders in the space. Like, you know what? Sure, let's do that. So we inverted the model and said, we're going to do 80% in direct investments and 20% in, in liquid protocols and a little bit in uh, other funds. And we went out to raise a small fund. We went out to raise $25 million and And we got lucky, right? And in the sense of, we, we found lightning in a bottle. We ran into a visionary couple of CIOs at, at the Fairfax County Pension Board, and, and they got it immediately and helped shepherd us through their board. And, you know, and they put in $21 million of our first $41 million fund. And, you know, Touchwood has been a really good fund. So they've done well. We've done well. Uh, and we made a bunch of investments in companies like Coinbase yeah. and BlockFi and, and others that have gone on to be really great infrastructure. But we also put you know, 20% of the fund in, in Bitcoin that has also done pretty well. So Morgan Creek Digital now has raised a second fund, $100 million. We're getting ready to raise our, our third fund. You know, those first two funds, that $140 million, you know, will return well over a billion dollars to investors, might return multiples of that actually. Wow. Um, but that's that's been fantastic. And uh, we're getting ready to raise our third fund there. And We've also launched some some products around digital assets. We have a digital asset index fund. We've launched a risk managed Bitcoin fund uh, with our partner Exos. So you know, we're we're doing a lot of things to help bring the masses, particularly institutions, into this space because it's still most people are, have it wrong, right? They still have zero exposure to digital assets. Our big thing is hashtag get off zero. When we look back five years from now. It will be fiduciarily improper, mm-hmm. be a dereliction of duty 
to have zero exposure to digital assets. And people think today it's fiduciarily improper to have digital assets. I'll argue just the opposite. Um, you have to have exposure, and, and that's our job is, is to help them get that exposure. And do you see increasingly so that these institutions are choosing or even considering Bitcoin as this asset that is potentially superior to gold or even bonds? Do you see these decisions taking place, or is it? Yeah. No, no, look, I, again, I think that's a really, really good insight in that you, know, you have to, it's a zero sum game, and that there's only so much room in a portfolio unless you lever and, and most institutions aren't going to lever. So they have to choose amongst their children and you've got to take it away from something. So I, I use this example that if five years ago, if you took all the endowments and you put them together, it's about $687 billion at the time. If you would have taken 1%, right? Just 1%, half a percent from stocks, half a percent from bonds and put it into to Bitcoin over the last five years, those endowments, instead of making 7.2, they would have made 9.2. Now, the cool thing is, had it gone to zero, which I'll argue was not even prob- you know, possible, but some would say it was, even if it did, uh, they would have made seven. That's a 10 to one upside downside capture. So that was a really good risk reward, a really good asymmetry. And it's zero correlated to bonds. Bitcoin is zero correlated to bonds and 0.15 correlated to stocks. So it's the perfect diversifying asset for an institutional portfolio. And if you think about going forward, there's an argument that says it's better than gold. Now, I I actually like physical gold. I think physical gold has a role in a portfolio. It's that truly dystopian scenario hedge, right? Where I I physically can't get to my electric or electronic records and and things are really bad. I can pick up my gold and take it with me and, and survive. So I, I think gold has a perfectly fine role, but it's a small position in a portfolio. I think Bitcoin has a has an enhanced role because you point out one, it's it's got superior qualities to gold uh, in terms of it's more divisible, it's more portable. Uh, so I think it's taking some share from gold, but importantly, it's taking share from bonds. Bonds have historically been this diversifying asset. And the problem is after a 40 year bull market in bonds where interest rates have now compressed to levels where bonds have basically become return free risk, you got all the risk and, and very little upside. I think taking some capital out of fixed income and putting it in Bitcoin is a really, really good idea. And I think more institutions are gonna figure that out. Um, you know, People like Michael Saylor are helping that. As, yeah. as they figured out, they, they actually borrow money in the markets. Now they don't have to pay any interest, which is kind of cool. They borrow money in the market and put Bitcoin on the balance sheet. And that's been a, a massively accretive transaction. I don't think everybody's going to do that. I think more people will. But ultimately, Bitcoin as an asset, right? it's a trillion dollar asset today. I think ultimately it will be a gold equivalent asset, which would be you know, probably somewhere around three trillion. If you think about you know the monetary equivalent of gold, you know the rest is jewelry and that kind of stuff, which probably not not really comparable. But the monetary uses of gold are you know three or four trillion. Uh, I think Bitcoin definitely gets to that level, and then comes the assault on currency. You know, could it be a replacement for fiat currency mm. over the long term? No question, it could. Uh, do I think it will be a reserve currency for sure. Do I think it will be the reserve currency? Don't know. Um, but I think it will be a reserve currency the way the renminbi or the euro or the yen is part of the, the central bank SDRs. The fund has quite a strong exposure to DeFi, which which you mentioned earlier, decentralized finance uh, with Aave, Uniswap, et cetera. At the moment, what do you think the core sort of value propositions are behind these tokens and also, what does the future hold on that front? What, why is it, why have you you sort of betting on that so much? Look, you know, DeFi and and just you know, we, we're not as big in DeFi as we should be. Um, we we were a little slow to you know put together. We should have put together a dedicated vehicle, but but we have certainly some exposure uh, to those assets. Uh, there's some really great managers out there that are much bigger into DeFi. What I think. DeFi is, you know, decentralized finance 
is, is taking traditional financial services models, whether it be peer-to-peer -peer lending, whether it be money market funds, whether it be deposits and rehypothecating and leveraging those deposits. Uh, there are a lot of different models that are, are just going to be superior in a smart contract world. You know, we're taking the middlemen out, we're stripping out the, the inefficiencies and the costs. Uh, we're making things happen faster, right? It, it's incomprehensible that a bank loan takes 30 days to settle. Yep. It's just ridiculous. But there are seven legacy systems. Some still run on COBOL and Fortran. They can't even find programmers to fix the code. But ultimately, I think all of, of that will, will migrate to DeFi. And one of the other things about DeFi that's so cool, you take Uniswap, for example, you know, it generates incredible amounts of, of revenue in the sense of fees on, on transactions that create real value. You know, one of the reasons Coinbase yep. value is as high as it is, is, you know, they take a piece of, of every transaction. And that's why exchanges have historically been such great investments. And, and Uniswap is doing that in, in the DeFi world that, you know, one of the, the challenges of, of tokenization in the early days, like the ICO boom, was you had people raising money on, on nothing, right? You, you didn't have equity. You didn't have bonds yeah, yeah. or credit. And you didn't have a claim on cash flow. They were just these utility tokens. And it was a great way to raise money. It was basically you know, crowdsourced venture capital, but, but you didn't have any rights or privileges. The nice thing about DeFi is in most of these protocols, there's actually cash that flows to the owners of the protocols. And, and that is a wonderful, uh, scalable business model. Mm. So you know, we, we think the, the future is very, very bright for DeFi. We think it's going to be uh, a massive disruptor to traditional finance. And that, that ultimately this model of you know, smart contracts metting out uh, cash flows to different you know, user bases within, within the protocols themselves and, and the communities built around the protocols is going to be spectacular. Yeah, it is very interesting to see a lot of the businesses, in particular DeFi and the exchanges, are, like you said, driving real value even this early on. And there's you know, real, well, huge sums of money going through it. When you compare that to some businesses that haven't even made or making anything and that are valued at huge valuations in a stock market, yes. uh, it's clear to see where there's a lot of value. Um, what's your, if you can talk about it, what's your prediction for sort of Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies for the next sort of year or so? Many people talk about following the stock to flow model and, and this sort of thing. I'm just interested to get your point of view on it. Yeah, look, I, I'm a big believer in, in plan B and, and stock to flow. I, I, I think it is a very elegant model. And I think it, it really represents well the, the having cycle. And I think the challenge for every asset is the balance between you know, hedgers and speculators. And ultimately, there will be uh, accumulators and, and hodlers and, and users and Ultimately, I think Bitcoin will, will evolve into this, this base layer protocol the same way that TCP IP is the base layer for the internet. And it will have things built on top of it, like lightning and other things. But, but in the short run, we're going to have these, these booms and busts really driven around, around speculation. So there was this model created even before stock to flow back in 2014. Yes, yeah. And, and it basically did, you know, nonlinear logarithmic regression that basically modeled out Metcalf's law and said, here's going to be the value of the Bitcoin network, because it's just a network and networks follow Metcalf's law. And here's the value over, you know, each of the years going forward. And it actually said that the value of the network um, would be around $10,000 in 2017. Uh, it was you know, off by six days. It actually got it down to the day. Uh, but the problem is the price, which is driven by speculators, went to 20,000 five weeks later. And that price was too high relative to value. And so then you get a correction. And unfortunately, corrections lead to overcorrections. So we corrected all the way to six by summer and then to three by December of the following year. And at three, you were so far under mm. fair value that, that you had to be a buyer. And ultimately, I think the same thing is going to happen here. So that, that same model predicts that we'll hit 100,000 in July of this year. 
uh, at fair value. Um, and again, I think that's a pretty accurate depiction of the value of the network. And the problem is the price uh, will be driven by the speculators. And the speculators, I think, are going to get caught up in, in the yeah. ebullience. And, and could they push it to you know, Max Kaiser's 220,000 target? Certainly possible. Um, but then I think we'll have another bust. Now, you bring up a really important point that could that bust be mitigated on the other side by increased institutional adoption? It's certainly possible. But institutions have weak hands too, right? It's not that institutions are all strong hands. You know, we're all human. And yeah, yeah. Uh, ultimately, if the price really starts to correct violently at the end of the year, um, my guess is, is we'll have another bear market. You know, will it last two years like the last ones? Yeah, maybe, maybe not, probably. Um, and I think it will be painful. And I think it it might not be 84% this time, but but I think it it will be a meaningful number. So I I think a lot of it will depend on how crazy the upside is. Let's say everyone front ran that event and we didn't go from the 100,000 fair value to 220. Then we'd have less of a downside, right? If we're closer to fair value, there's no real reason to have a, a puke. Yeah. And uh, I think it'd, it'd be less volatile. I think volatility has been shrinking, but it's still high, right? And what people forget, right? I use this example all the time, is Amazon, been a public company for 21 years. It actually has the same volatility as Bitcoin, around 80%. And Amazon has had a double-digit drawdown every single year, including this year. Its average drawdown is 31% five times greater than 50% and twice greater than 90%. Well, when was the right time to sell Amazon? Never. But who bought Amazon 21 years ago and holds it today? I joke, mm -hmm. Jeff, his mom, his dad, and now his ex-wife. That's it. No one else had diamond hands to hold through those big drawdowns. And I think the same is true of Bitcoin. You know, there are very few people, including institutions, that, that can stomach big drawdowns when it doesn't make sense to them. Well, the problem is if you're looking at price, it won't make sense. You have to look at value. And the value of the network today, I'll argue, is somewhere around, you know, 70-ish thousand. Uh, so we're roughly close to fair value, maybe even a little undervalued. And I think we'll be close to 100,000 by, by summertime. Uh, but if we go much above that, it's likely we're going to have a lot of volatility. Got you. Yeah, very, very interesting to see how that plays out for the rest of the year. Um, I wanted to just quickly touch on something else you mentioned. The greatest wealth is created by being an early investor in innovation. Um, and now, obviously, today I wanted to talk about SPACs in particular in relation to this, because I know you're a big, you know, big, big advocate of this. How can people take advantage of, of this early innovation through SPACs? Yeah, so look, SPACs are a pretty interesting innovation in the sense themselves, right? And that uh, there's been a lot of changes. You know, 50 years ago when the SPACs were first created, it was a dark place. I, you know, I joke, it's the NIT tournament of, you know, money raising. Uh, no one wants to go to the NIT tournament. Everybody wants to be the NCAA tournament. But, you know, the NIT tournament does exist. And so if you couldn't get public 50 years ago, you did a SPAC and not shockingly, they were the lesser quality companies. And in many cases, they were, you know, pump and dumps from financial sponsors. And, and so for years, SPACs was a, a dark place that you didn't want to hang out. Well, in 2015, they changed the rules and they, they did a bunch of things that, that basically created a legal structure that was more beneficial to high growth, innovative companies. They relaxed the rules on profitability. They relaxed the rules on track record. In fact, my first boss had a great line, no truly new idea can, by definition, have a track record, full stop. And so since 2015, you've seen a migration of later stage private businesses that are high growth kind of companies of the future, as we like to call them, migrating to the SPAC. And Bill Gurley wrote a blog post a couple of years ago saying that you know, given these changes, the SPAC merger is going to become the preferred method of going public for high growth innovative companies. 
And I think that's been the case. One out of four com companies last year that went public was a SPAC. If you did it on dollars, it was actually 53% because the average SPAC is bigger than the average IPO. Mm -hmm. There's information content there actually. It's actually probably higher quality. Um, and then of those SPACs last year, two thirds of them were in five industries, space travel and exploration, uh, electrification of vehicles, autonomy, um, online gaming and esports. All of those industries are companies of the future, industries of the future. Right? There are no space tourists today, zero. There will be lots, not going to be me personally, but you know, someone is going to get on a Virgin Galactic flight and go tour in space and pay big money. But it doesn't exist today. And electrification of vehicles, yes, we have Teslas and we have a few others, but it's a fraction of where it will be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, probably take 30 years for it to be ubiquitous. Um, autonomy. We have zero autonomous vehicles, right? I mean, not zero, zero. I mean, there are a few driving around. I probably wouldn't get in one right now because um, there's still dead spots uh, in, in cell coverage. So, you know, if you and I are talking on the phone and our call drops, not a big deal. If I'm having a car driven and the edge computing drops, that's, that's dangerous. Don't like that. So until 5G is more oh ubiquitous, I, I'm yeah. not getting in an autonomous vehicle. And by the way, you know, Elon promised us a million robo taxis. We have zero. So that's a problem. But uh, online gaming, esports, I mean, esports, how many people know that more people will watch esports this year in the United States than any other league except the NFL? More than basketball, more than baseball, more than hockey more than golf, more than tennis, esports, people playing video games, other people watching other people play video games. It is monster, monster business. And so investing in these businesses used to be only for the rich, right? You had to be an accredited investor and you had to invest in the private markets. Now, because of SPACs, you can actually invest in these companies in the future, but they're going to be volatile. They're going to look like Amazon. They're going to have 50% drawdowns. They're going to have 90% drawdowns. You have to buy and hold. You need an active approach. Mm -hmm. That's why we create our ETF, an active approach to weed out the best companies, the true companies of the future from the pretenders, right? I did a presentation. What's so special about special purpose acquisition companies? And on the left, I showed a picture of Chamath and Richard Branson. I bet on those two guys 10 times out of 10 every day. Okay. On the right, I showed a picture of a former author, a former congressman, and a former Goldman Sachs operating executive, not an investment guy. I probably don't want to invest with those three guys. They may be very nice guys, but I'm not giving them money, no matter how big their SPAC is. So now people say, oh, what about celebrities? If Shaq yeah. does a SPAC, I'm in. I don't even care what it is. I love the guy. I think he's a genius. There's another guy. If Chameleonaire were to raise a SPAC, <laughs> I'm in. One of the smartest investors I've met, you know, from the celebrity world, probably in my career. Unbelievably smart. I would invest with that guy. You know, people say, what about A-Rod? I don't know. If he stays to baseball and he buys a franchise, that could be interesting, right? Owning sports franchises is a pretty interesting business because there's always somebody with a bigger ego that will pay more later. But if he does something different than that, I don't know. Maybe we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's a smart guy, but but we'll see. But it's more about the company yeah. and the industry and the opportunity. Um, but people get so caught up in short-term performance. They get so caught up in the wiggles. And look, investing is a funny thing. I say it's the only business I know. When things go on sale, people run out of the store. The cheaper the price, the further they run. And what you should do is you should you know mm. identify big trends. And you should buy early. And when they go down, you should buy more. And it reminds me of my very first meeting when I formed Morgan Creek was with this very nice guy, 83-year-old guy, you know, Southern gentleman, bow tie, whole thing. And you know, built a $300 million fortune. We we're pitching him to, to be one of our anchor investors. And I asked him, I said, you know, sir, how did you make your fortune? He said, see that map on the wall? I'm like, yeah, there was a map of, of Charlotte, North Carolina. And had these red circles drawn like a bullseye. And I said, okay, I see that. I see the map. And he says, well, I 
figure out the path of progress, which way the city's growing. And then I buy land one circle out and I wait. And I said, that's it? And he said, yeah, that's it. I said, okay, that's, that's a pretty good strategy. So if you can get in the path of progress, right? If you can figure out where things are going and you just buy and you're patient. And if you're given the chance, you know, to buy at a cheaper price, buy more, it's a pretty good deal. So my next question would be, not all SPACs are equal in their opportunity and risk. And you've implied that a little bit with the, you know, Shamath versus um, sort of uh, the Goldman Sachs. It's all about the people, Ed. <laughs> it's always about the people. It's always about the people. Is that, so yeah, I was going to say the number one thing, if you people. could say, it's about the people. It's okay. about the people, right? Most people invest according to the four Ps. And they really only focus on one, performance or price. That's the exact wrong way to start. There are four Ps. People philosophy, process, and performance or price. And you want to go in that order. So for us, it's always people. I will back people a hundred times out of a hundred. I don't care what the price is. I don't care what the volatility of the price is. In fact, the best way to hire managers, right? Great hedge fund managers. You want someone with a great long-term track record who just had a crappy short-term period. Right? Yeah. Everybody's picking on Melvin Capital, you know, with the GameStop thing. You know, he lost 50%. That's when you want to give the guy money. You don't want to run away, right? He's got a great long-term track record. He's a spectacular investor. Yeah, he made a mistake. We all make mistakes. And uh, Dean Smith, famous coach at, here at Carolina, yeah. this great thing about mistakes, we all make them. And in fact, winners mm. make more mistakes than losers because the losers are so paralyzed about making a mistake that they don't act. So winners aren't afraid of mistakes because winners know that all you have to do is Ralph. Recognize the mistake, admit the mistake, learn from it and forget it. And what separates the great investors, the great anything, great basketball players, great football players, great investors, great artists from the average is the average person always focuses on the last play, right? They're focused on the most recent experience. The greats focus on the next play. How many times against basketball season, how many times have we seen someone miss a shot, go down and commit a stupid foul? Mm -hmm. The great player misses the shot, doesn't even remember taking the shot, hustles back, plays good defense, steals the ball, makes the layup. That's the difference. Are there any themes in particular, such as EVs, healthcare, space, you mentioned a few, that you're most excited about? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, you know, I'm not probably a, a good person to talk about space travel because I don't, I don't really want to do it. And I don't really think, you know, I don't think we're going to Mars, but. You know, some people do. Um, and I don't, I don't know why anyone would pay money to go, you know, up in a rocket that, you know, could blow up, but, you know, people will do it. So space travel, you know, we own a little bit, but, you know, I'll let those guys figure it out. I am wildly excited about autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, Just cause? So every, every car will be self-driving yeah. in the future and we will ride in vehicles. We probably won't own the vehicles. They'll just circle around and we'll get in the ones when we need to. And it'll be a pay as you go type of thing. Um, it'll free up so much capital, free up so much time. It'll be awesome. Uh, and that, that will definitely happen. So I think that technology and, and all the sensors and LIDAR and radar and, and all the things that, that go into that are, are really interesting. Um, in healthcare, I think there are just some unbelievable opportunities uh, in innovation, we just did a, a, a SPAC uh, or invested in a SPAC that, you know, they've created uh, engineered blood vessels. I mean, unbelievable science, science fiction, right? You know, yeah. Josh Wolf from Lux says the best, right? You know, want to invest in science fiction becoming science fact. And uh, I think that's one of the things that SPACs do really, really well. It allows you to invest in things that, that don't exist yet but will exist in the future. And in, in, in essence, it's a way for accredited investors, or I'm sorry, for non-accredited investors to invest in liquid venture capital. That's the best way to think about it. Amazing. Thanks, Mark. This has been incredible. Um, it's great to get your, your sort of words of wisdom. I'm, I'm sure everyone is going to really appreciate it. Um, just to finish, I just wanted to ask if you could sum up what you believe your edge is in investing. Ah, so I, I appreciate the question, Ed. And uh, you know, actually, Ed Gotham has got EDG right there. You're, you're almost edge embodied. 
Um, so I believe in edge and I, and it's, it's my thing, right? Hashtag edge on Twitter. And, and to me, there, there, there are lots of different edges you can have, right? You can have an information edge, right? You can have better information or access to information better than others. Um, you know, you can have an analytical edge. You can have better computing power models or better algorithms. Uh, you can have a processing edge. You can just be better, faster uh, at processing. Um, you can have a, a unique insight edge, right? You could you could have a, a unique insight or, or thesis or or idea uh, that gives you an edge. Um, to me, I would say my edge historically has been uh, a couple things. One. Uh, I've been blessed to uh, have some great mentors. And so I've had access to just incredible talent and knowledge and experience. And that, is, that has helped me uh, embrace things a little bit early. So I would say you know, one of my you know, things I focus on as edge is, is that, a, that willingness and ability to be early and not worry about being wrong as much, you know. I said, tell the funny story. My wife has only seen me speak one time. And at the end of the talk, she says, you, know, you can't say things like that. I'm like, what do you mean? She says, you know, you say things so forcefully. I'm like, what's wrong with that? She says, well, people will believe you. I'm like, well, that's kind of the idea. She says, but what if you're wrong? Says, oh my gosh, I'm wrong all the time. I just changed my mind. Like that is the one thing I hate about Twitter is people <laughs> will search, you know, three years back and find something yeah. that I said that, that didn't turn out. And they're like, oh, look, you were wrong. I'm like, are you kidding me? I've changed my mind seven times in three years. So. Uh, I will also say that that humility is is maybe the most important edge. Um, you got to be able to laugh at yourself. You got to be able to to not take yourself too seriously. And I separate humility from confidence and conviction. I have lots of conviction, right? I say things forcefully. I have strong opinions, but they're loosely held because I believe I have the humility to say, yeah, I was wrong. And I'm going to move on and, and try again. Uh, and then another edge is resilience. You know, the ability to, to go from failure to failure with, you know, increasing enthusiasm. As uh, Thomas Edison said, I never failed. I just found 10,000 ways not to make a light bulb. And uh, I think that's one of the things that I've, I've done pretty well in my career is, is just try a lot of things. And don't worry about being wrong and, and be resilient enough to get back up and, and try new things and, and reinvent yourself. So um, probably too long an answer, but uh, I appreciate the question. No, that was great. And um, can you just uh, tell our listeners where they can find you and like follow your sort of insights? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. I'll have a unique last name, uh, Yusko, Y-U-S-K-O. So it's at Mark Yusko, M-A-R-K-Y-U-S-K-O uh, on Twitter. Uh, I actually do respond to DMs from time to time. Um, so you can find me there. I'm, I suck at email. Uh, everyone who knows me will tell you that. So uh, that's a curse. Uh, I'm also uh, Morgan Creek Cap, C-A-P dot com. Um, is our website and you can find us there. But the dirty little secret of uh, finding me is, is to get to know Pam Clark, who's my assistant. Uh, she manages my life and, and makes sure I do things like this. So I appreciate her putting us together. I appreciate the invitation. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks again. I'm sure everyone's going to really enjoy this. All right. Thanks, Ed. Be well. Thanks for listening, everyone. Just a quick note before we sign off. If you're looking for an easily digestible daily update on the markets, this might be of interest. Opto Updates is our short newsletter sent every day during the trading week, giving you a bulleted list of the top seven stories from the global stock markets. We've done the hard work for you, highlighting relevant opportunities and trends. And in addition, we'll also keep you notified of any new products, stock reports or webinars from the Opto world. If you're interested, sign up using the link in the show notes. And thanks also to Kofruition for consulting on and producing the show. Until next time.